18. Department of Labor and Related Agencies Jonathan Berry Mission Statement At the heart of the conservative promise is the resolve to reclaim the role of each American worker as the protagonist in his or her own life and to restore the family as the centerpiece of American life. The role that labor policy plays in that promise is twofold, give workers the support they need for rewarding, well-paying, and self-driven careers, and restore the family supporting job as the centerpiece of the American economy. The Judeo-Christian tradition, stretching back to Genesis, has always recognized fruitful work as integral to human dignity, as service to God, neighbor, and family. And Americans have long been known for their work ethic. While it is primarily the culture's responsibility to affirm the dignity of work, our federal labor and employment agencies have an important role to play by protecting workers, setting boundaries for the healthy functioning of labor markets, and ultimately encouraging wages and conditions for jobs that can support a family. Overview The labor agencies covered in this chapter include the Department of Labor, Dole, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, the National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, the National Mediation Board, NMB, the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, FMCS, and the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, PBGC. Congress has provided these agencies with the authority to enforce a wide range of federal statutes regulating workplace conduct, workforce development, employee benefits, labor organization and bargaining, and international labor conditions. In the sweep of American history, these authorities are relatively new. They largely come from Congress's attempts in the middle of the 20th century to resolve major political questions brought about by labor conflict, the civil rights movement, and the emergence of the modern workplace. The 21st century has brought about new challenges. Ranging from collapsing manufacturing sector employment and a decrease in family supporting jobs, to the massive expansion of an increasingly radical human resources. Bureaucracy. In many cases, these challenges are as significant as the 20th century labor crises and workplace changes that the agencies were developed to manage. But the agencies have failed to respond to these challenges. Despite significant progress by the Trump administration, a massive administrative state now hangs over productive industry and labor organization, acting as a damper on social and economic life. And under the Biden administration, that administrative state has imposed the most assertive left-wing social engineering agenda in the agency's history and ratcheted up regulatory costs on small businesses and other productive industry. The agency's authorities have been abused by the left to favor human resources bureaucracies, climate change activists, and union bosses all against the interest of American workers. Needed reforms. Reverse the DEI revolution in labor policy. Under the Obama and Biden administrations, labor policy was yet another target of the diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, revolution. Under this managerialist left-wing race and gender ideology, every aspect of labor policy became a vehicle with which to advance race, sex, and other classifications and discriminate against conservative and religious viewpoints on these subjects and others, including pro-life views. The next administration should eliminate every one of these wrongful and burdensome ideological projects. Eliminate racial classifications and critical race theory trainings. The Biden administration has pushed racial equity in every area of our national life, including in employment, and has condoned the use of racial classifications and racial preferences under the guise of DEI and critical race theory, which categorizes individuals as oppressors and victims based on race. Non-discrimination and equality Are the law, DEI is not. Title VII flatly prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of race, color, and national origin. The President should L. Issue an executive order banning, and Congress should pass a law prohibiting the federal government from using taxpayer dollars to fund all critical race theory training, CRT. L. Direct DOJ and EEOC to enforce Title VII. The President should direct the Department of Justice and Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to enforce Title VII to prohibit racial classifications and quotas, including human resources classifications and DEI trainings that promote critical race theory. L. Eliminate EEO-1 data collection. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission collects EEO-1 data on employment statistics based on race-slash-ethnicity, which data can then be used to support a charge of discrimination under a disparate impact theory. This could lead to racial quotas to remedy alleged race discrimination. The Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, OFP, also has a right to the data EEOC collects. Crudely categorizing employees by race or ethnicity fails to recognize the diversity of the American workforce and forces individuals into categories that do not fully reflect their racial and ethnic heritage. L. Amend Title VII The next administration should work with Congress to amend Title VII to prohibit the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission from collecting EEO-1 data and any other racial classifications in employment for both private and public workplaces. L. Eliminate disparate impact liability. With interracial marriages in America increasing, many Americans do not fit neatly into crude racial categories. Point one under disparate impact theory, moreover, discriminatory motive or intent is irrelevant, the outcome is what matters. But all workplaces have disparities. Congress should 
L. Eliminate disparate impact as a valid theory of discrimination for race and other bases under Title VII and other laws. Disparities do not, and should not legally, imply discrimination per SE. The President should. L. Sign an executive order explicitly forbidding OFP from using disparate impact in its analysis. L. Eliminate OFP. The Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, OFP, exists to enforce Executive Order, EO. 11,246.2 That order was originally signed in 1965 to require federal contractors, and subcontractors, to commit to non-discrimination. It gave enforcement authority to the Department of Labor, up to and including debarment from federal contracting. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has since grown, often making OFPS authority redundant and imposing a second regulatory agency under whose rules businesses must operate. In addition, under EO 11,246, the President and Dole can force a huge swath of American employers to comply with rules and regulations based on novel anti-discrimination theories, such as sexual orientation and gender identity theories, that Congress had never imposed by statute. L. Rescind EO 11246 The President should eliminate OFP by simply rescinding EO 11246. Federal contractors would still be bound by statutory non-discrimination law but would no longer work under overlapping regimes. Contractors' residual obligations under Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act and Vietnam-era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act, VEVRA, could be enforced by EEOC or Dole. Contractors also would be less subject to the changing political whims of a president that might impose significant new costs or burdens on the contractors. Sex Discrimination The Biden administration, LGBT advocates and some federal courts have attempted to expand the scope and definition of sex discrimination. Based in part on the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock v. Clayton County, Bostock held that an employer who fires someone simply for being homosexual or transgender violates Title VII's prohibition against sex discrimination. The court explicitly limited its holding to the hiring-slash-firing context in Title VII and did not purport to address other Title VII issues, such as bathrooms, locker rooms, and dress codes, or other laws prohibiting sex discrimination. Notably, the court focused on the status of the employees and used the term transgender status rather than the broader and amorphous term gender identity. L. Restrict the application of Bostock. The new administration should restrict Bostock's application of sex discrimination protections to sexual orientation and transgender status in the context of hiring and firing. L. Withdraw unlawful notices and guidances. The president should direct agencies to withdraw unlawful notices and guidances purporting to apply Bostock's reasoning broadly outside hiring and firing. L. Rescind regulations prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, transgender status, and sex characteristics. The President should direct agencies to rescind regulations interpreting sex discrimination provisions as prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, transgender status, sex characteristics, etc. L. Direct agencies to refocus enforcement of sex discrimination laws. The President should direct agencies to focus their enforcement of sex discrimination laws on the biological binary meaning of sex. Pro-life measures. L. Promote pro-life workplace accommodations for mothers. Federal law should protect life and promote pro-family policies. Current law, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act 3 provides non-discrimination protections in the workplace for pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. The Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, PWFA, 4 requires employers to make reasonable accommodations for women to the known limitations related to the pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, unless the accommodation would impose an undue hardship on the operation of the employer's business. The Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA also provides non-discrimination and accommodation protections in the workplace for certain pregnancy-related disability. Point five. None of these laws requires an employer provide health insurance benefits for elective abortion. L. Pass a law requiring equal, or greater, benefits for pro-life support for mothers and clarifying abortion exclusions. Congress should pass a law requiring that to the extent an employer provides employee benefits for abortion, it must provide equal or greater benefits for pregnancy, childbirth, maternity, and adoption. That law should also clarify that no employer is required to provide any accommodations or benefits for abortion. L. Keep anti-life benefits out of benefit plans. Some benefits attorneys and pro-choice advocates have argued since the Supreme Court's Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization Decision 6 that the long-standing doctrine of Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, ERISA, 7 preemption should block individual states' efforts to prohibit employers from helping employees procure abortions via offering various kinds of coverage under employee-sponsored benefit plans. ERISA should not be allowed to trump states' ability to protect innocent human life in the womb. Congress and Dole should clarify that ERISA does not preempt states' power to restrict abortion, surrogacy, or other anti-life benefits. Religion. L. Provide robust protections for religious employers. America's religious diversity means that workplaces include people of many faiths and that many employers are faith-based. Nevertheless, the Biden administration has been hostile to people of faith, especially those with traditional beliefs.
about marriage, gender, and sexuality. The new administration should enact policies with robust respect for religious exercise in the workplace, including under the First Amendment, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993, RFRA, A Title VII, and federal conscience protection laws. L issue an executive order protecting religious employers and employees. The President should make clear via executive order that religious employers are free to run their businesses according to their religious beliefs, general non-discrimination laws notwithstanding, and support participation of religious employees and employers as federal contractors and in federal activities and programs. L clarify Title VII's religious organization exemptions. Congress should clarify Title VII's religious organization exemptions to make it more explicit that those employers may make employment decisions based on religion regardless of non-discrimination laws. L provide robust accommodations for religious employees. Title VII requires reasonable accommodations for an employee's sincerely held religious beliefs, observances, or practices unless it poses an undue hardship on the employer's business. These accommodation protections also apply to issues related to marriage, gender, and sexuality. Unless the Supreme Court overrules its bad precedent, Congress should clarify that undue hardship means significant difficulty or expenses, not more than at a minimized cost as the court has previously held. General EEOC Reforms The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission EEOC does not have rulemaking authority under Title VII and other laws it enforces, yet it issues guidance, technical assistance, and other documents, including some that push new policy positions. EEOC should disclaim its regulatory pretensions and abide by the guidance reforms discussed. Below. LEEOC should disclaim its regulatory pretensions. L affirm decision-making via majority vote of commissioners. EEOC should affirm as policy the Title VII requirement that it exercise substantive power via majority vote of commissioners, not by unilateral chair action or by delegation to staff. L disclaim power to enter into consent decrees. EEOC should disclaim power to enter into consent decrees that require employer actions that it could not require under the laws it enforces. L reorient enforcement priorities. EEOC should reorient its enforcement priorities toward claims of failure to accommodate disability, religion, and pregnancy, but not abortion. Refocusing labor regulation on the good of the family. The DEI revolution. In labor affected not only the administrative state, but it has also targeted much of the private sector. Owing to the combination of regulatory pressure and eager human resources offices in the private sector, much of American labor and employment policy has become institutionally oriented toward woke goals. Retracting regulations that support this revolution is a good first step, but more is needed. We must replace woke nonsense with a healthy vision of the role of labor policy in our society, starting with the American family. L. Allow workers to accumulate paid time off. Lower and middle income workers are more likely to be in jobs that are subject to overtime laws that require employers to pay time and a half for working more than 40 hours a week. L. Congress should enact the Working Families Flexibility Act. The Working Families Flexibility Act would allow employees in the private sector the ability to choose between receiving time and a half pay or accumulating time and a half paid time off, a choice that many public sector workers already have. For example, if an individual worked two hours of overtime every week for a year, he or she could accumulate four weeks of paid time off to use for paid family leave vacation, or any reason. L. Congress should incentivize on-site childcare. Across the spectrum of professionalized childcare options, on-site care puts the least stress on the parent-child bond. L. Congress should amend the Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, to clarify that an employer's expenses in providing on-site childcare are not part of an employee's regular rate of pay. L. Dole should commit to honest study of the challenges for women in the world of professional work. The Women's Bureau at Dole tends towards a politicized research and engagement agenda that puts predetermined conclusions ahead of empirical study. L. The Bureau should rededicate its research budget towards open inquiry, especially to disentangle the influences on women's workforce participation and to understand the true causes of earnings gaps between men and women. L. Equalize retirement savings access across married households. The limit on individual contributions to a 401, K, 403, B, or similar work-based retirement account is $22,500 for 2023. Individuals who do not work or do not have access to a work-based retirement account can save up to $6,500 in an IRA. This individual-based system creates a disadvantage for married couples with only one spouse who works, or with two working spouses, one of whom earns less than the maximum retirement account contribution. L to equalize access.
Project 2025 Presidential Transition Project Copyright 2023 by the Heritage Foundation 214 Massachusetts Avenue NE Washington DC 20002 202-546-4400 heritage.org All rights reserved. Printed in the United States of America. ISBN 978-0-89195-174-2 Warning, empty page. Warning, empty page. Contents. Acknowledgements, 9. The Project 2025 Advisory Board, XI. The 2025 Presidential Transition Project. A note on Project 2025, 13. Authors, 15. Contributors, XXV. Forward, A Promise to America, 1. Kevin D. Roberts, Ph.D. Section 1, Taking the Reins of Government, 19. 1 White House Office, 23. Rick Dearborn. 2 Executive Office of the President. Of the United States, 43. Russ Vaught. 3 Central Personnel Agencies. Managing the Bureaucracy. 69. Donald Devine, Dennis Dean Kirk, and Paul Danz. Section 2, The Common Defense, 87. 4 Department of Defense, 91. Christopher Miller. 5 Department of Homeland Security, 133. Ken Cuccinelli. 6 Department of State, 171. Kyron K. Skinner. 7 Intelligence Community, 201. Dustin J. Carmack. 8 Media Agencies, 235. U.S. Agency for Global Media, 235. Mora Namdar. Corporation for Public Broadcasting, 246. Mike Gonzalez. 9. Agency for International Development, 253. Max Primorak. Section 3, The General Welfare, 283. 10. Department of Agriculture, 289. Darren Baxt. 11. Department of Education, 319. Lindsay M. Burke. 12. Department of Energy and Related Commissions, 363. Bernard L. McNamee. 13. Environmental Protection Agency, 417. Mandy M. Gunaskara. 14. Department of Health and Human Services, 449. Roger Severino. 15. Department of Housing and Urban Development, 503. Benjamin S. Carson, Sr., M.D. 16. Department of the Interior, 517. William Perry Pendley. 17. Department of Justice, 545. Jean Hamilton. 18. Department of Labor. And Related Agencies, 581. Jonathan Berry. 19. Department of Transportation, 619. Diana Furcht Gottroth. 20. Department of Veterans Affairs, 641. Brooks D. Tucker. Section 4, The Economy, 657. 21. Department of Commerce, 663. Thomas F. Gilman. 22. Department of the Treasury, 691. William L. Walton, Stephen Moore, and David R. Burden. 23. Export-Import Bank, 717. The Export-Import Bank should be abolished, 717. Veronique de Rugui. The Case for the Export-Import Bank, 724. Jennifer Hazelton. 24. Federal Reserve, 731. Paul Winfrey. 25. Small Business Administration, 745. Karen Kerrigan. 26. Trade, 765. The Case for Fair Trade, 765. Peter Navarro. The Case for Free Trade, 796. Kent Lassman. Section 5, Independent Regulatory Agencies, 825. 27. Financial Regulatory Agencies, 829. Securities and Exchange Commission. And Related Agencies, 829. David R. Burden. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, 837. Robert Bose. 28. Federal Communications Commission, 845. Brendan Carr. 29. Federal Election Commission, 861. Hans A. von Spakovsky. 30. Federal Trade Commission, 869. Adam Kanjab. Onward, 883. Edwin J. Foilner. Warning, empty page. Acknowledgements. This work, Mandate for Leadership 2025, The Conservative Promise, is a collective effort of hundreds of volunteers who have banded together in the spirit of advancing positive change for America. Our work is by no means the comprehensive compendium of conservative policies, nor is our group the exclusive cotter of conservative thinkers. The ideas expressed in this volume are not necessarily shared by all. What unites us is the drive to make our country better. First and foremost, we thank the chapter authors and contributors who gave so freely of their time in service of their country. 
we were particularly grateful to have the help of dedicated members of the Heritage Foundation's management and policy teams. Executive Vice President Derek Morgan, Chief of Staff Wesley Coopersmith, Associate Director of Project 2025 Spencer Kratian, and Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies Director Paul Ray devoted a significant amount of their valuable time to reviewing and editing the lengthy manuscript and provided expert advice and insight. The job of transforming the work of dozens of authors and hundreds of contributors into a cohesive manuscript fell upon Heritage's formidable team of editors led by Director of Research Editors Therese Penafather, Senior Editor William T. Poole, Marla Hess, Jessica Lother, Karina Rollins, and Kathleen Scaturro, without whose tireless efforts you would not be reading these words. The talented work of Data Graphics Services Manager John Fleming, Manager of Web Development and Print Projects Jay Simon, Director of Marketing Elizabeth Fender, Senior Graphic Designer Grace DeSandro, and Senior Designer Melissa Bluey came together to bring the volume to life. We also thank the dedicated junior staff who provided immeasurable assistance, especially Jordan Embry, Sarah Calvies, and Jonathan Moy. Most important, we are grateful to the leadership, supporters, and donors of each of the Project 2025 Advisory Board member organizations and those of the Heritage Foundation, without whom Project 2025 would not be possible. Thank you. Paul Dance and Stephen Groves Warning, Empty Page The Project 2025 Advisory Board Alabama Policy Institute Alliance Defending Freedom American Compass The American Conservative America First Legal Foundation American Accountability Foundation American Center for Law and Justice American Cornerstone Institute American Council of Trustees and Alumni American Legislative Exchange Council The American Main Street Initiative American Moment American Principles Project Center for Equal Opportunity Center for Family and Human Rights Center for Immigration Studies Center for Renewing America Claremont Institute Coalition for a Prosperous America Competitive Enterprise Institute Conservative Partnership Institute Concerned Women for America Defense of Freedom Institute Ethics and Public Policy Center Family Policy Alliance Family Research Council First Liberty Institute Forge Leadership Network Foundation for Defense of Democracies Foundation for Government Accountability Freedom Works The Heritage Foundation Hillsdale College Honest Elections Project Independent Women's Forum Institute for the American Worker Institute for Energy Research Institute for Women's Health Intercollegiate Studies Institute James Madison Institute Keystone Policy The Leadership Institute Liberty University National Association of Scholars National Center for Public Policy Research Pacific Research Institute Patrick Henry College Personnel Policy Operations Recovery for America Now Foundation 1792 Exchange Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America Texas Public Policy Foundation Tineo Network Young America's Foundation The 2025 Presidential Transition Project A Note on Project 2025 We Want You the 2025 Presidential Transition Project is the conservative movement's unified effort to be ready for the next conservative administration to govern at 12 o'clock noon, January 20, 2025. Welcome to the mission. By opening this book, you are now a part of it. Indeed, one set of eyes reading these passages will be those of the 47th President of the United States, and we hope every other reader will join in making the incoming administration a success. History teaches that a president's power to implement an agenda is at its apex during the administration's opening days. To execute requires a well-conceived, coordinated, unified plan and a trained and committed cadre of personnel to implement it. In recent election cycles, presidential candidates normally began transition planning in the late spring of election year or even after the party's nomination was secured. That is too late. The federal government's complexity and growth advance at a seemingly logarithmic rate every four years. For conservatives to have a fighting chance to take on the administrative state and reform our federal government, the work must start now. The entirety of this effort is to support the next conservative president, whoever he or she may be. In the winter of 1980, the fledging Heritage Foundation handed to President-elect Ronald Reagan the inaugural mandate for leadership. This collective work by conservative thought leaders and former government hands most of whom were not part of Heritage set out policy prescriptions, agency by agency for the incoming president. The book literally put the conservative movement and Reagan on the same page, and the revolution that followed might never have been, save for this band of committed and volunteer activists. With this volume, we have gone back to the future and then some. It's not 1980. In 2023, the game has changed. The long march of cultural Marxism through our institutions has come to pass. The federal government is a behemoth, 
weaponized against American citizens and conservative values, with freedom and liberty under siege as never before. The task at hand to reverse this tide and restore our republic to its original moorings is too great for any one conservative policy shop to spearhead. It requires the collective action of our movement. With the quickening approach of January 2025, we have two years and one chance to get it right. Project 2025 is more than 50, and growing, of the nation's leading conservative organizations joining forces to prepare and seize the day. The axiom goes personnel. Is policy, and we need a new generation of Americans to answer the call and come to serve. This book is functionally an invitation for you the reader Mr. Smith, Mrs. Smith and Ms. Smith to come to Washington or support those who can. Our goal is to assemble an army of aligned, vetted, trained, and prepared conservatives to go to work on day one to deconstruct the administrative state. The project is built on four pillars. L Pillar I This volume puts in one place a consensus view of how major federal agencies must be governed and where disagreement exists brackets out these differences for the next president to choose a path. L Pillar II is a personnel database that allows candidates to build their own professional profiles and our coalition members to review and voice their recommendations. These recommendations will then be collated and shared with the president-elect's team, greatly streamlining the appointment process. L Pillar III is the Presidential Administration Academy, an online educational system taught by experts from our coalition. For the newcomer, this will explain how the government functions and how to function in government. For the experienced, we will host in-person seminars with advanced training and set the bar for what is expected of senior leadership. L in Pillar 4 The Playbook We are forming agency teams and drafting transition. Plans to move out upon the President's utterance of So Help Me God. As Americans living at the approach of our nation's 250th birthday, we have been given much. As conservatives, we are as much required to steward this precious heritage for the next generation. On behalf of our coalition partners, we thank you and invite you to come join with us at projectt2025.org. Paul Dans. Director, Project 2025. Authors. Darren Baxter's Deputy Director, Center for Energy and Environment, and Senior Fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, CEI. Before joining CEI, Darren was a Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where he played a leading role in the launch of the organization's new Energy and Environmental Center. For a decade, he led Heritage's food and agricultural policy work, and he edited and co-authored Heritage's book Farms and Free Enterprise. He has testified numerous times before Congress, has appeared frequently on media outlets, and has played leadership roles in such organizations such as the Federalist Society, American Agricultural Law Association and Food and Drug Law Institute, serving on the Food and Drug Law Journal's editorial advisory board. Jonathan Berry is managing partner at Boyden Gray and Associates PLLC. He served as Acting Assistant Secretary for Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor, overseeing all aspects of rulemaking and policy development. At the U.S. Department of Justice, he assisted with the development of regulatory policy and with the nominations of Justice Neil Gorsuch and dozens of other judges. He previously served as Chief Counsel for the Trump transition and earlier clerked for Associate Justice Samuel Alito and Judge Jerry Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He is a graduate of Yale College and Columbia University School of Law. Lindsay M. Burke is director of the Center for Education Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Burke served on Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin's Transition Steering Committee and Landing Team for Education. She serves on the Board of Visitors for George Mason University, the Board of the Educational Freedom Institute, and the Advisory Board of the Independent Women's Forum's Education Freedom Center. Dr. Burke's research has been published in such journals as Social Science Quarterly, Educational Research and Evaluation, and Research in Educational Administration and Leadership. She holds a BA from Hollins University, and MA from the University of Virginia, and a PhD from George Mason University. David R. Burton is Senior Fellow in Economic Policy in the Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. He focuses on securities regulation, tax policy, business law, entrepreneurship, administrative law, financial privacy, the U.S. Department of Commerce, corporate welfare, international investment, international information sharing, the U.S. economic relationship with China, and climate-related financial risk. Previously, Burton was General Counsel at the National Small Business Association, a partner in the Argus Group, Vice President, Finance and General Counsel for New England Machinery, and Manager of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Tax Policy Center. He holds a JD from the University of Maryland School of Law and a BA in Economics from the University of Chicago. Adam Kanjab is a professor of law at Michigan State University. His scholarly research focuses on telecommunication, antitrust, and Internet issues. He served as Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Deputy Associate Attorney General at the Justice Department during the Trump administration. He received his BA magna cum laude from Yale University and his JD magna cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Dustin J. Carmack is Research Fellow for Cybersecurity, Intelligence and Emerging 
Technologies in the Border Security and Immigration Center at the Heritage Foundation. Previously, he served in the intelligence community as Chief of Staff to the Director of National Intelligence, John Ratcliffe. In Congress, he served as Chief of Staff to Congressman John Ratcliffe, TX04, and Congressman Ron DeSantis, FL06. Mr. Carmack studied at Truman State University in Missouri and Tel Aviv University in Israel. Brendan Carr has nearly 20 years of private sector and public sector experience in communications and tech policy. He currently serves as the senior Republican on the Federal Communications Commission. Prior to this role, Carr served as the Federal Communication Commission's general counsel. Earlier, he worked as an attorney at Wiley Rain LLP. Previously, he clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. After graduating from Georgetown University, he earned his J.D. Magna Cum Laude from the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law where he served as an editor of the Catholic University. Law Review Benjamin S. Carson, Sr., M.D., is founder and chairman of the American Cornerstone Institute and previously served as the 17th Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Born in Detroit to a single mother with a third-grade education, Dr. Carson was raised to love reading and education. He attended Yale and earned his M.D. from the University of Michigan Medical School. For nearly 30 years, Dr. Carson served as Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the Johns Hopkins Children's Center, where he performed the first separation of twins conjoined at the back of the head. Ken Cuccinelli served as Acting Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services in 2019 and then, from November 2019 through the end of the Trump administration, as Acting Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. During his tenure as Acting Deputy Secretary, Ken also served as the Chief Regulatory Officer for the Department of Homeland Security. He also has served the Commonwealth of Virginia, first as a state senator and then as Virginia's 46th Attorney General. Rick Dearborn served as Deputy Chief of Staff for President Donald Trump and was responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of five separate departments of the Executive Office of the President. He also served as Executive Director of the 2016 President-elect Donald Trump Transition Team. Before that, Rick served in several roles, including as Chief of Staff, in the office of then U.S. Senator Jeff Sessions, R.L., for nearly two decades. Between his two tours in Senator Sessions' office, he was appointed by President George W. Bush as Assistant Secretary of Energy for Congressional Affairs. Earlier in his career, Rick worked for the National Republican Senatorial Committee, the Senate Republican Conference, and the Senate Steering Committee. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a BA in Public Administration and a minor in Economics. Veronique Daruga is the George Gibbs Chair in Political Economy and Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and a nationally syndicated columnist. Her primary research interests include the U.S. economy, the federal budget, taxation, tax competition, and cronyism. Daruga is the author of a weekly opinion column for the Creators Syndicate, writes regular columns for Reason Magazine, and blogs about economics at National Review Online's The Corner. She received her MA in economics from the Paris Dauphine University and her PhD in economics from the Pantheon Sorbonne University. Donald Devine is senior scholar at the Fund for American Studies in Washington, D.C. He was President Ronald Reagan's first term Office of Personnel Management Director when the Washington Post labeled him Reagan's terrible swift sword of the civil service for cutting bureaucracy and reducing spending by billions of dollars. He was a professor at the University of Maryland and Bellevue University and is a columnist and author of 10 books, including his recent The Enduring Tension. Diana Furcht Gottroth, an Oxford-educated economist, directs the Center for Energy, Climate and Environment at the Heritage Foundation and is adjunct professor of economics at George Washington University. Diana served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology at the U.S. Department of Transportation, where she directed the department's $1.2 billion research budget, the Office of Positioning, Navigation and Timing and Spectrum Management, and the University Transportation Center Program. Diana worked in senior roles in the White House under Presidents Ronald Reagan, George H. W. Bush, and George W. Bush, where she was Chief of Staff of the Council of Economic Advisors. Thomas F. Gilman served as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Administration and Chief Financial Officer of the U.S. Department of Commerce in the Trump Administration. Currently, he is a Director of ACLJ Action and Chairman of Torngat. Medals Tom is the former CEO of Chrysler Financial and has had a 40-plus year career as a senior executive and entrepreneur in the global automotive industry, including roles at Chrysler Corporation, Cerberus Capital Management, Asbury Automotive Group, TD Auto Finance, and Automotive Capital Services. He holds a BS in finance from Villanova University. Mandy M. Gunaskara of Oxford, Mississippi, is a principal at Section 7 Strategies. A senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum, and visiting fellow in the Center for Energy, Climate, and Environment at the Heritage Foundation. During the Trump administration, Mandy served as the Chief of Staff at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as well as Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation. She previously served in numerous 
roles at the U.S. House of Representatives and U.S. Senate, including as Majority Counsel for the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee under Chairman Jim Inhofe. She received her B.A. from Mississippi College and her J.D. from the University of Mississippi School of Law. Jean Hamilton is Vice President and General Counsel of America First Legal Foundation. Jean served as Counselor to the Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice, Senior Counselor to the Secretary of Homeland Security, General Counsel on the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, Assistant Chief Counsel at U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and as an Attorney Advisor in the Secretary's Honors Program for Attorneys at the Department of Homeland Security. Jean graduated from the Washington and Lee University School of Law Magna Cum Laude and Order of the Coif and has a B.A. in International Affairs from the University of Georgia. Jennifer Hazelton has worked as a Senior Strategic Consultant for the Department of Defense and Industrial Base Policy and has held senior positions at USAID, the Export-Import Bank of the United States, and the State Department. She was also a Communications Director in the U.S. Congress and worked as an award-winning journalist for CNN and Fox News Channel. Hazelton holds an MA in Business Administration from Emory University and earned her B.A. from the University of Georgia. Karen Kerrigan is President and CEO of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council and has helped to strengthen U.S. entrepreneurship and global business growth for 28 years. She has provided counsel across the globe via training missions focused on entrepreneurial development, effective advocacy, policy formation, and implementation. Karen testifies regularly before Congress and has served on numerous federal advisory boards representing the interests of entrepreneurs and small businesses. Dennis Dean Kirk is Associate Director for Personnel Policy with the 2025 Presidential Transition Project at the Heritage Foundation. Born and raised in Kansas, he graduated with honors from Northern Arizona University and Washburn University Law School. Dennis has over 45 years of experience in private law and public federal government counsel services. He served in President George Bush's administration in the U.S. Army's Office of General Counsel and later as Associate General Counsel for Strategic Integration and Business Transformation where he was recognized with the Exceptional Civilian and Meritorious Civilian Service Awards and other awards. During the Trump administration, Dennis served in senior positions at the Office of Personnel Management and was nominated by President Trump to be chairman of the Merit Systems Protection Board. Kent Lassman is president and CEO of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Educated at the Catholic University of America and North Carolina State University. He has written on telecommunications, privacy, environmental, antitrust, and consumer protection regulation as well as trade policy and the design of regulatory systems. Kent's policy research and advocacy have taken him to 45 state capitals, more than a dozen countries, and deep into the heart of the federal regulatory state. Bernard L. McNamee is an energy and regulatory attorney with a major law firm and was formerly a member of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. He is also the Street Distinguished Visiting Professor of Law at the Appalachian School of Law. In addition to serving as a Federal Energy Regulatory Commissioner, McNamee has served in various senior policy and legal positions throughout his career, including at the U.S. Department of Energy, for U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, and for Virginia Governor George Allen. McNamee also served four attorneys general in two states, Virginia and Texas. Christopher Miller served in several positions during the Trump administration, including as acting U.S. Secretary of Defense, Director of the National Counterterrorism Center, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Combating Terrorism, and Senior Director for Counterterrorism and Transnational Threats at the National Security Council. Before his civilian service in the Department of Defense, Miller was an Army Green Beret in the 5th Special Forces Group with multiple combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, achieving the rank of Colonel. Miller earned a BA from George Washington University and an MA from the Naval War College. He also graduated from the College of Naval Command and Staff and the Army War College. Stephen Moore is a conservative economist and author. He is currently a senior economist at Freedom Works a distinguished fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and a Fox News analyst. From 2005 to 2014, Moore served as the senior economics writer for the Wall Street Journal editorial page and as a member of the journal's editorial board. He still contributes regularly to the journal's editorial page. He is a frequent lecturer to business investment and university audiences around the world on the U.S. economic and political outlook in Washington, D.C. Moore Namdar is an attorney and senior fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council. She speaks fluent Farsi and is an expert on U.S. national security, human rights, global communications, the Middle East, and international law. Mora served as senior advisor for critical issues at the U.S. State Department and was appointed by President Donald Trump to perform the duties of the Assistant Secretary of State for Consular Affairs. She also served as Vice President of Legal, Compliance, and Risk at the U.S. Agency for Global Media. Peter Navarro holds a Ph.D. in economics from Harvard and was one of only three senior White House officials to serve with Donald Trump from the 2016 campaign to the end of the president's first term. He was the West Wing's chief China hawk and trade czar and served as director of the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy and Defense Production Act Policy Coordinator.
His books include The Coming China Wars, 2006, Death by China, 2011, Crouching Tiger, 2015, and his White House memoirs in Trump Time, 2021, and Taking Back Trump's America, 2022. His top-rated Taking Back Trump's America podcast appears on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. William Perry Pendley was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming. He earned a BA and an MA from George Washington University, was a U.S. Marine Corps captain, and earned his JD from the University of Wyoming College of Law. He was an attorney on Capitol Hill, a senior official for President Ronald Reagan, and leader of the Bureau of Land Management for President Donald Trump. For 30 years, he was president of Mountain States Legal Foundation where he argued and won cases before the Supreme Court of the United States. He authored five books, including Sagebrush Rebel, Reagan's Battle with Environmental Extremists and Why It Matters Today. Max Primorak is director of the Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. He was acting chief operating officer and assistant to the administrator, Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Previously he was deputy director of Iraq's reconstruction program at the U.S. Department of State and a senior advisor in the office of the secretary. Max was educated at Franklin and Marshall College and the University of Chicago. Roger Severino is vice president of domestic policy at the Heritage Foundation. As director of the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, from 2017 to 2021, he led a team of more than 250 staff enforcing civil rights, conscience, and health information privacy laws. Roger subsequently founded the HHS Accountability Project at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He holds a JD from Harvard Law School, and MA in Public Policy from Carnegie Mellon University, and a BA from the University of Southern California. Kyron K. Skinner is President and CEO of the Foundation for America and the World, TOG Professor of International Relations and Politics at Pepperdine University's School of Public Policy, W. Glenn Campbell Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution, and a Visiting Fellow and Senior Advisor at the Heritage Foundation. Skinner served as Director of Policy Planning and Senior Advisor at the U.S. Department of State from 2018 to 2019 and was a member of the Defense Business Board at the U.S. Department of Defense in 2020. Skinner holds an MA and a PhD in political science from Harvard University and undergraduate degrees from Spelman College and Sacramento City College. Brooks D. Tucker served in the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs as Assistant Secretary for Congressional and Legislative Affairs from 2017 to 2021 and as Acting Chief of Staff from 2020 to 2021. He helped to craft the policy framework for President-elect Trump's transition team and served as the Senior Policy Advisor for National Security and Veterans Affairs to Senator Richard Burr from 2010 to 2015. A retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel, Brooks served in Afghanistan, Iraq, North Africa, the Caucasus, and the Western Pacific. He is a graduate of the University of Maryland, Marine Corps Infantry Officer Course, and Marine Corps Command and Staff College and holds a Certificate in Legislative Studies from Georgetown University. Hans A. von Spakovsky is Senior Legal Fellow and Manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative in the Edwin Meese Center III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. He is a former member of President Donald Trump's Advisory Commission on Election Integrity. From 2006 to 2007, Von Spakovsky was a commissioner on the Federal Election Commission. He served as career counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Justice from 2002 to 2005. Russ Vaught is founder and president of the Center for Renewing America. A longtime conservative leader on Capitol Hill, Russ served in President Trump's cabinet as director of the Office of Management and Budget, where he oversaw the implementation of the presidential budget, key policies on deregulation, and a landmark effort to eliminate critical race theory and other radical ideologies in executive agencies. Prior to his White House service, Russ spent nearly two decades in the broader conservative movement on Capitol Hill, including as policy director for the House Republican Conference, executive director of the Republican Study Committee, and legislative assistant to former U.S. Senator Phil Graham. Russ graduated with a B.A. from Wheaton College and received a J.D. from George Washington University Law School. William L. Walton is chairman of the Resolute Protector Foundation and host of The Bill Walton Show. In 2016 and 2017, Mr. Walton served in President-elect Donald Trump's transition team as agency action leader for all the federal economic agencies. He served as chairman of the board and CEO of Allied Capital Corporation, a $6 billion NICE-traded private investment firm, from 1997 to 2010. He is the immediate past president of the Council for National Policy. His extensive board service includes the Heritage Foundation, American Conservative Union, American Enterprise Institute, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Venture Capital Association, and Financial Services Roundtable. Paul Winfrey is Distinguished Fellow in Economic Policy and Public Leadership at the Heritage Foundation. Before rejoining Heritage in 2018, Paul was Deputy Assistant to the President, Deputy Director of the Domestic Policy Council, 
and Director of Budget Policy at the White House. During the 2016 presidential transition, he led the team responsible for the Office of Management and Budget. He also has served as a senior staff member for the U.S. Senate Committee on the Budget. Paul served in both the Biden and Trump administrations for three terms as the chair of the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board that oversees the Fulbright Program. An educational exchange is sponsored by the Department of State. Editors Paul Dance is director of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project at the Heritage Foundation, organizing policy and personnel recommendations and training for appointees in the next presidential administration. Before joining Heritage, he served in the Trump administration as chief of staff at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, as OPM's White House liaison, and as a senior advisor at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Paul has extensive experience in high-stakes commercial litigation and worked for several large international law firms in New York City from 1997 to 2012 before founding his own law firm. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Law and received his graduate and undergraduate degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Stephen Groves is the Margaret Thatcher Fellow in the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom at the Heritage Foundation. Groves served in the Trump administration. First as Ambassador Nikki Haley's Chief of Staff at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. He later joined the White House as Assistant Special Counsel, representing the White House in the Mueller investigation. Groves also served as White House Deputy Press Secretary. His prior positions include Senior Counsel for the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations and Associate at Boys, Schiller and Flexner LLP. Groves holds an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center, a JD from Ohio Northern University's College of Law, and a BA from Florida State University. Warning, Empty Page Contributors the contributors listed below generously volunteered their time and effort to assist the authors in the development and writing of this volume's 30 chapters. The policy views and reform proposals herein are not an all-inclusive catalog of conservative ideas for the next president, nor is there unanimity among the contributors or the organizations with which they are affiliated with regard to the recommendations. Mark Albrecht Chris Anderson, Office of Senator Steve Daines Jeff Anderson, The American Main Street Initiative Michael Anton, Hillsdale College E.J. Antony the Heritage Foundation. Andrew Art Arthur, Center for Immigration Studies. Paul Atkins, Potomac Global Partners. Julie Axelrod, Center for Immigration Studies. James Bacon. James Baer. Stuart Baker, Stepto and Johnson LLP. Eric Baptist, Alliance Defending Freedom. Brent Bennett, Texas Public Policy Foundation. John Berlaw, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Russell Berman, Hoover Institution. Sanjay Bogat, University of Colorado Boulder. Stephen Billy, Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America. Brad Bishop, American Cornerstone Institute. Willis Bixby, WWBX, LLC. Josh Blackman, South Texas College of Law. Jim Blue, Defense of Freedom Institute for Policy Studies. Robert Bordens, Classical Conversations. Rachel Bovard, Conservative Partnership Institute. Robert Bose. Matt Bowman, Alliance Defending Freedom. Stephen G. Bradbury, the Heritage Foundation. Preston Brashers, The Heritage Foundation. Jonathan Bronitsky, Athos. Kyle Brosnan, The Heritage Foundation. Patrick T. Brown, Ethics and Public Policy Center. Robert Burkett, ACLJ Action. Michael Burley, American Cornerstone Institute. David R. Burden, The Heritage Foundation. Jonathan Butcher, The Heritage Foundation. Mark Busby, Busby Maritime Associates, LLC. Margaret Byfield, American Stewards of Liberty. David Bird, Corn Ferry. Anthony Compau, Center for Renewing America. James J. Carafano, The Heritage Foundation. Frank Carroll, Professional Forest Management. Oren Cass, American Compass. Brian J. Kavanaugh, American Global Strategies. Spencer Kratian, The Heritage Foundation. Claire Christensen, American Cornerstone Institute. Victoria Coates, The Heritage Foundation. Ellie Kohanim, Independent Women's Forum. Ezra Cohen. Elbridge Colby, Marathon Initiative. Earl Comstock, White and Case LLP. Lisa Correnti, Center for Family and Human Rights, CFAM. Monica Crowley, The Nixon Seminar. Laura Cunliffe, Independent Women's Forum. Tom Dans, Amber Wave Partners. Sahin Dasgupta, Taft Statintinius and Hollister LLP. Sergio de la Pina. Krista Ruder, National Center for Urban Operations. Corey DeAngelis, American Federation for Children. Caroline DeBerry, Paragon Health Institute. Ariel Del Turco, Family Research Council. IRV Dennis, American Cornerstone Institute. David Depchula, Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Donald Devine, The Fund for American Studies. 
Chuck DeVore, Texas Public Policy Foundation. C. Wallace DeWitt, Allen and Overy LLP. James DePayne, The Heritage Foundation. Matthew Dickerson, The Heritage Foundation. Michael Ding, America First Legal Foundation. David Ditch, The Heritage Foundation. Natalie Dodson, Ethics and Public Policy Center. Dave Dory, The Fairness Center. Max Eden, American Enterprise Institute. Troy Edgar, IBM Consulting. Joseph Edlow, The Heritage Foundation. Jen Ellinger, Booz Allen Hamilton. John Errett, Office of Senator Josh Hawley. Kristen Ike Amer, The Heritage Foundation. Robert S. Eitel, Defense of Freedom Institute for Policy Studies. Will Estrada, Parents' Rights Foundation. John Fear, Center for Immigration Studies. Barak Fiegenbaum, Reason Foundation. Travis Fisher, The Heritage Foundation. George Fishman, Center for Immigration Studies. Leslie Ford, The Heritage Foundation. Aharon Friedman, Federal Policy Group. Bruce Fronin, Ohio Northern University College of Law. Joel Frushone, Ernst & Young. Finch Fulton. Diana Furcht Gottroth, The Heritage Foundation. Kali Gable, American Cornerstone Institute. Christopher Gasek, Family Research Council. Alexandra Gazer, River Financial Inc. Mario Garza. Patty Jane Geller, The Heritage Foundation. Andrew Gillen, Texas Public Policy Foundation. James S. Gilmore III, Gilmore Global Group LLC. Van Skin, Economic Consulting, LLC. Al McGolden, The Institute for Women's Health. Mike Gonzalez, The Heritage Foundation. Chadwick R. Gore, Defense Forum Foundation. David Gordeler, Ethics and Public Policy Center. Brian Gottstein, The Heritage Foundation. Dan Greenberg, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Rob Greenway, Hudson Institute. Rachel Gressler, The Heritage Foundation. DJ Gribben, Madras Consulting. Garrison Gris Edale, American Cornerstone Institute. Joseph Grogan, USC Schaffer School for Health Policy and Economics. Andrew Guernsey. Jeffrey Gunter, Republican Jewish Coalition. Joe Guy, Club for Growth. Joseph Guzman. Amalia Halikias, The Heritage Foundation. Jean Hamilton, America First Legal Foundation. Richard Hanania, Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology. Simon Hankinson, The Heritage Foundation. David Harlow. Derek Harvey, Office of Congressman Devin Nunes. Jason Hayes, Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Jennifer Hazelton. Lou Heinzer. Edie Heipel. Trupp Hemingway, Personnel Policy Operations. Nathan Hitchin, Equal Rights Institute. Pete Hoekstra. Gabriella Hoffman, Independent Women's Forum. Tom Homan, The Heritage Foundation. Chris Horner. Mike Howell, The Heritage Foundation. Valerie Huber, The Institute for Women's Health. Andrew Hughes, American Cornerstone Institute. Joseph Hugh Meyer, Center for a Secure Free Society. Christopher Iacovella, American Securities Association. Melanie Israel, The Heritage Foundation. Ken Ivory, Utah House of Representatives. Roman Jankowski, The Heritage Foundation. Abby Jones. Emily Cow, Alliance Defending Freedom. Jared M. Kelson, Boyden Gray and Associates. Aaron Cariety, Ethics and Public Policy Center. Ali Kilmartin, Alliance Defending Freedom. Julie Kirchner, Federation for American Immigration Reform. Dan Kish, Institute for Energy Research. Kenneth A. Klukowski. Adam Korzanuski, American Principles Project. Kathy Nuabel Kovarik, Sajida Solutions, LLC. Bethany Kozma, Keystone Policy. Matthew Kozma. Julius Krein, American Affairs. Stanley Kurtz, Ethics and Public Policy Center. David Lassert, Baker Botts, LLP. Paul J. Larkin, The Heritage Foundation. Kent Lassman, Competitive Enterprise Institute. James R. Lawrence III, and Visage Law. Paul Lawrence, Lawrence Consulting. Nathan Lemer, Targeted Victory. David Leggetts, University of Delaware, RET. Marlo Lewis, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Ben Lieberman, Competitive Enterprise Institute. John Ligon. Evelyn Lim, American Cornerstone Institute. Mario Loyola, Competitive Enterprise Institute. John G. Malcolm, The Heritage Foundation. Joseph Masterman, Cooper and Kirk. PLLC. Earl Matthews, The Vandenberg Coalition. Dan Mahler, Heritage Action for America. Drew McCall, American Cornerstone Institute. Trent McCotter, Boyden Gray and Associates. Micah Meadowcroft, The American Conservative. Edwin Meese III, The Heritage Foundation. Jessica Malugan, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Frank Mermud, 
Orpheus International. Mark Miller, Office of Governor Christy Noam. Cleta Mitchell, Conservative Partnership Institute. Kevin E. Molley. Caitlin Moon, American Center for Law and Justice. David Moore, Brigham Young University Law School. Claire Morell, Ethics and Public Policy Center. Mark Morgan, The Heritage Foundation. Hunter Morgan, American Cornerstone Institute. Rachel Morrison, Ethics and Public Policy Center. Jonathan Moy, The Heritage Foundation. Ian Murray, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Ryan Nabil, National Taxpayers Union. Michael Nasai, Jackson Walker LLP. Lucien Niemeyer, The Niemeyer Group, LLC. Nazak Nikoktar, Wiley Rain LLP. Milan Mitch Nikolic. Matt O'Brien, Immigration Reform Law Institute. Caleb Orr, Boyden Gray and Associates. Michael Pack. Leah Peterson. Michael Pillsbury, The Heritage Foundation. Patrick Pizella, Leadership Institute. Robert Poole, Reason Foundation. Kevin Preskanis, Alimar Health Solutions. Pam Pryor, National Committee for Religious Freedom. Thomas Pyle, Institute for Energy Research. John Ratcliffe, American Global Strategies. Paul Ray, The Heritage Foundation. Joseph Redden, Flex Elise Forestry, LLC. J.W. Richards, The Heritage Foundation. Jordan Richardson, Heise Suarez Melville, PA. Jason Richwine, Center for Immigration Studies. Sean Riley, The American Conservative. Laura Rice, The Heritage Foundation. Leo Rios. Mark Robeck, Energy Evolution Consulting LLC. James Rockas, ACLJ Action. Mark Royce, Nova Onondale College. Reed Rubenstein, America First Legal Foundation. William Ruger, American Institute for Economic Research. Austin Roos, Center for Family and Human Rights, CFAM. Brent D. Sadler, The Heritage Foundation. Alexander William Salter, Texas Tech University. John Sanders, John Locke Foundation. Carla Sands, America First Policy Institute. Robbie Stephanie Saunders, Coalition for a Prosperous America. David Sov. Brett D. Schaefer, The Heritage Foundation. Nina Ocherenko Schaefer, The Heritage Foundation. Matt Shook, American Cornerstone Institute. Justin Schwab, CGCN Law. John Schwepp, American Principles Project. Mark Scribner, Reason Foundation. Darren Selnick, Selnick Consulting. Josh Sewell, Taxpayers for Common Sense. Kathleen Scamma, Western Energy Alliance. Matt Sharp, Alliance Defending Freedom. Judy Shelton, Independent Institute. Nathan Symington. Lauren Smith, Skyline Policy Risk Group. Zach Smith, The Heritage Foundation. Jack Spencer, The Heritage Foundation. Adrian Sparrow, U.S. House Committee on Homeland Security. Thomas W. Spohr, The Heritage Foundation. Peter St. Ange, The Heritage Foundation. Chris Stanley, Functional Government Initiative. Paula M. Stannard. Parker Stathatos, Texas Public Policy Foundation. William Steiger, Independent Consultant. Kenny Stein, Institute for Energy Research. Corey Stewart, Stewart PLLC. Mari Stahl. Catherine T. Sullivan, 1792 Exchange. Brett Swearingen, Miller Johnson. Michael Sweeney. Robert Swope. Aaron Sabo, CGCN Group. Katie Tolento, All Better Health. Tony Tata, Tata Leadership Group, LLC. Farnas Farkish Thompson. Todd Thurman, American Cornerstone Institute. Brett Tolman, Tolman Group. Kayla M. Tonneson, Recovery for America Now Foundation. Joe Trotter, American Legislative Exchange Council. T. Vi Troy, Mercatus Center. Clayton Tufts. Aaron Valdez, Texas Public Policy Foundation. Mark Van Droff. Jessica M. Vaughn. Center for Immigration Studies. John J. V. Venable, The Heritage Foundation. Morgan Lorraine Vina, Jewish Institute for National Security of America. Andrew N. Volmer, Mercatus Center. Hans A. Von Spakovsky, The Heritage Foundation. Greg Walcher, Natural Resources Group, LLC. David M. Walsh, Dakota Group. Aaron Walsh, The Heritage Foundation. Jacqueline Ward, American Cornerstone Institute. Emma Waters, The Heritage Foundation. Michael Williams, American Cornerstone Institute. Aaron Wolf. Jonathan Wolfson. Alexei Woltornist, Athos. Frank Wilco. Cesar Ibarra, Freedom Works. John Zadrosny, America First Legal Foundation. Laura Zork, Freedom Works. Warning, Empty Page. Forward. A Promise. To America. Kevin D. Roberts, Ph.D. 44 years ago, 
the United States and the conservative movement were in dire straits. Both had been betrayed by the Washington establishment and were uncertain whom to trust. Both were internally splintered and strategically adrift. Worse still, at that moment of acute vulnerability and division, we found ourselves besieged by existential adversaries, foreign and domestic. The late 1970s were by any measure a historic low point for America and the political coalition. Dedicated to preserving its unique legacy of human flourishing and freedom. Today, America and the conservative movement are enduring an era of division and danger akin to the late 1970s. Now, as then, our political class has been discredited. By wholesale dishonesty and corruption. Look at America under the ruling and cultural elite today, inflation is ravaging family budgets, drug overdose deaths continue to escalate, and children suffer the toxic normalization of transgenderism. With drag queens and pornography invading their school libraries. Overseas, a totalitarian communist dictatorship in Beijing is engaged in a strategic, cultural and economic cold war against America's interests, values, and people all while globalist elites in Washington awaken only slowly to that growing threat. Moreover, low-income communities are drowning in addiction and government dependence. Contemporary elites have even repurposed the worst ingredients of 1970s radical chic to build the totalitarian cult known today as the Great Awakening. And now, as then, the Republican Party seems to have little understanding about what to do. Most alarming of all, the very moral foundations of our society are in peril. Yet students of history will note that, notwithstanding all those challenges, the late 1970s proved to be the moment when the political right unified itself and the country and led the United States to historic political, economic, and global victories. The Heritage Foundation is proud to have played a small but pivotal role in that story. It was in early 1979 amidst deflation, gas lines, and the Red Army's invasion of Afghanistan the nadir of Jimmy Carter's days of malaise that Heritage launched the Mandate for Leadership project. We brought together hundreds of conservative scholars and academics across the conservative movement. Together, this team created a 20-volume, 3,000-page governing handbook containing more than 2,000 conservative policies to reform the federal government and rescue the American people from Washington dysfunction. It was a promise from the conservative movement to the country confident, specific, and clear. Mandate for Leadership was published in January 1981 the same month Ronald Reagan was sworn into his presidency. By the end of that year, more than 60% of its recommendations had become policy and Reagan was on his way to ending stagflation, reviving American confidence and prosperity, and winning the Cold War. The bad news today is that our political establishment and cultural elite have once again driven America toward decline. The good news is that we know the way out even though the challenges today are not what they were in the 1970s. Conservatives should be confident that we can rescue our kids, reclaim our culture, revive our economy, and defeat the anti-American left at home and abroad. We did it before and we'll do it again. As Ronald Reagan put it, freedom is a fragile thing and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by way of inheritance, it must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation. One. This is the duty history has put before us and the standard by which our generation of conservatives will be judged. And we should not want it any other way. The legacy of mandate for leadership, and indeed of the entire Reagan revolution, is that if conservatives want to save the country, we need a bold and courageous plan. This book is the first step in that plan. The Conservative Promise This volume The Conservative Promise is the opening salvo of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project, launched by the Heritage Foundation and our many partners in April 2022. Its 30 chapters lay out hundreds of clear and concrete policy recommendations for White House offices, cabinet departments, Congress and agencies, commissions, and boards. Just as important as the scope of the Conservative Promise's recommendations is the breadth of its authorship. This book is the product of more than 400 scholars and policy experts from across the conservative movement and around the country. Contributors include former elected officials, world-renowned economists, and veterans from four presidential administrations. This is an agenda prepared by and for conservatives who will be ready on day one of the next administration to save our country from the brink of disaster. The Heritage Foundation is once again facilitating this work. But as our dozens of partners and hundreds of authors will attest, this book is the work of the entire conservative movement. As such, the authors express consensus recommendations already forged, especially along four broad fronts that will decide America's future. 1. Restore the family as the centerpiece of American life and protect our children. 2. Dismantle the administrative state and return self-governance to the American people. 3. Defend our nation's sovereignty, borders, and bounty against global threats. 4. Secure our God-given individual rights to live freely what our Constitution calls the blessings of liberty. What makes these four pieces of the conservative promise so valuable to the next president is that they cut through superficial distractions and focus on the moral and foundational challenges America faces in this moment of history. This was one of the secrets of conservatives' success in the Reagan era, one our generation should emulate. As in the late 1970s, Americans today experience the failures of political and cultural 
elites in countless ways, in the job market and in the grocery store checkout lines, on the streets and in our schools, in the media and within our institutions. But in truth, these daily dysfunctions are not innumerable problems, but innumerable manifestations of a few core crises. In 1979, the threats we faced were the Soviet Union, the socialism of 1970s liberals, and the predatory deviancy of cultural elites. Reagan defeated these beasts by ignoring their tentacles and striking instead at their hearts. His approach to the Cold War? We win and they lose. His economic agenda? The human dignity of work and its many rewards. His platform in the culture wars? The community of values embodied in these words, family, work, neighborhood, peace, and freedom. This book and Project 2025 as a whole will arm the next conservative president. With the same kind of strategic clarity, but for a new age. Promise number one. Restore the family as the centerpiece of American life and protect our children. The next conservative president must get to work pursuing the true priority of politics the well-being of the American family. In many ways, the entire point of centralizing political power is to subvert the family. Its purpose is to replace people's natural loves and loyalties with unnatural ones. You see this in the popular left-wing aphorism, government is simply the name we give to the things we choose to do together. But in real life, most of the things people do together have nothing to do with government. These are the mediating institutions that serve as the building blocks of any healthy society. Marriage. Family. Work. Church. School. Volunteering. The name real people give to the things we do together is community, not government. Our lives are full of interwoven, overlapping communities, and our individual and collective happiness depends upon them. But the most important community in each of our lives and the life of the nation is the family. Today, the American family is in crisis. 40% of all children are born to unmarried mothers, including more than 70% of black children. There is no government program that can replace the hole in a child's soul cut out by the absence of a father. Fatherlessness is one of the principal sources of American poverty, crime, mental illness, teen suicide, substance abuse, rejection of the church, and high school dropouts. So many of the problems government programs are designed to solve but can't are ultimately problems created by the crisis of marriage and the family. The world has never seen a thriving, healthy, free, and prosperous society where most children grow up without their married parents. If current trends continue, we are heading toward social implosion. Furthermore, the next conservative president must understand that using government alone to respond to symptoms of the family crisis is a dead end. Federal power must instead be wielded to reverse the crisis and rescue America's kids from familial breakdown. The conservative promise includes dozens of specific policies to accomplish this existential task. Some are obvious and long-standing goals like eliminating marriage penalties in federal welfare programs and the tax code and installing work requirements for food stamps. But we must go further. It's time for policymakers to elevate family authority, formation, and cohesion as their top priority and even use government power, including through the tax code, to restore the American family. Today the left is threatening the tax-exempt status of churches and charities that reject woke progressivism. They will soon turn to Christian schools and clubs with the same totalitarian intent. The next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke culture warriors. This starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. DEI, gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness, gender sensitive. Abortion, reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Americans of their First Amendment rights out of every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant, regulation and piece of legislation that exists. Pornography, manifested today in the omnipresent propagation of transgender ideology and sexualization of children, for instance, is not a political Gordian knot inextricably binding up disparate claims about free speech, property rights, sexual liberation, and child welfare. It has no claim to First Amendment protection. Its purveyors are child predators and misogynistic exploiters of women. Their product is as addictive as any illicit drug and as psychologically destructive as any crime. Pornography should be outlawed. The people who produce and distribute it should be imprisoned. Educators and public librarians who purvey it should be classed as registered sex offenders. And telecommunications and technology firms that facilitate its spread should be shuttered. In our schools, the question of parental authority over their children's education is a simple one, schools serve parents, not the other way around. That is, of course, the best argument for universal school choice a goal all conservatives and conservative. Presidents must pursue. But even before we achieve that long-term goal, Parents' rights as their children's primary educators should be non-negotiable in American schools. States, cities, and counties, school boards, union bosses, principals, and teachers who disagree should be immediately cut off from federal funds. 
the noxious tenets of critical race theory and gender ideology should be excised from curricula in every public school in the country. These theories poison our children, who are being taught on the one hand to affirm that the color of their skin fundamentally determines their identity and even their moral status while on the other they are taught to deny the very creatureliness that inheres in being human and consists in accepting the givenness of our nature as men or women. Allowing parents or physicians to reassign the sex of a minor is child abuse and must end. For public institutions to use taxpayer dollars to declare the superiority or inferiority of certain races, sexes, and religions is a violation of the Constitution and civil rights law and cannot be tolerated by any government anywhere in the country. But the pro-family promises expressed in this book, and central to the next conservative president's agenda, must go much further than the traditional, narrow definition of family issues. Every threat to family stability must be confronted. This resolve should color each of our policies. Consider our approach to big tech. The worst of these companies prey on children, like drug dealers, to get them addicted to their mobile apps. Many Silicon Valley executives famously don't let their own kids have smartphones. Point two, they nevertheless make billions of dollars addicting other people's children to theirs. TikTok, INSTagram, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media platforms are specifically designed to create the digital dependencies that fuel mental illness and anxiety, to fray children's bonds with their parents and siblings. Federal policy cannot allow this industrial scale child abuse to continue. Finally, conservatives should gratefully celebrate the greatest pro family win in a generation overturning Roe v. Wade, a decision that for five decades made a mockery of our Constitution and facilitated the deaths of tens of millions of unborn children. But the Dobbs decision is just the beginning. Conservatives in the states and in Washington, including in the next conservative administration, should push as hard as possible to protect the unborn in every jurisdiction in America. In particular, the next conservative president should work with Congress to enact the most robust protections for the unborn that Congress will support while deploying existing federal powers to protect innocent life and vigorously complying with statutory bans on the federal funding of abortion. Conservatives should ardently pursue these pro-life and pro-family policies while recognizing the many women who find themselves in immensely difficult and often tragic situations and the heroism of every choice to become a mother. Alternative options to abortion, especially adoption, should receive federal and state support. In summary, the next president has a moral responsibility to lead the nation in restoring a culture of life in America again. Promise number two, dismantle the administrative state and return self-governance to the American people. Of course, the surest way to put the federal government back to work for the American people is to reduce its size and scope back to something resembling the original constitutional intent. Conservatives desire a smaller government not for its own sake, but for the sake of human flourishing. But the Washington establishment doesn't want a constitutionally limited government because it means they lose power and are held more accountable by the people who put them in power. Like restoring popular sovereignty, the task of reattaching the federal government's constitutional and democratic tethers calls to mind Ronald Reagan's observation that there are no easy answers, but there are simple answers. In the case of making the federal government smaller, more effective, and accountable, the simple answer is the constitution itself. The surest proof of this is how strenuously and creatively generations of progressives and many Republican Insiders have worked to cut themselves free from the strictures of the 1789 Constitution and subsequent amendments. Consider the federal budget. Under current law, Congress is required to pass a budget and 12 issue specific spending bills comporting with it every single year. The last time Congress did so was in 1996. Congress no longer meaningfully budgets, authorizes, or categorizes spending. Instead, party leaders negotiate one multi trillion dollar spending bill several thousand pages long and then vote on it before anyone, literally, has had a chance to read it. Debate time is restricted. Amendments are prohibited. And all of this is backed up against a midnight deadline when the previous omnibus spending bill will run out and the federal government shuts down. This process is not designed to empower 330 million American citizens and their elected representatives, but rather to empower the party elite secretly negotiating. Without any public scrutiny or oversight. In the end, congressional leaders' behavior and incentives here are no different. From those of global elites insulating policy decisions over the climate, trade, public health, you name it from the sovereignty of national electorates. Public scrutiny and democratic accountability make life harder for policymakers so they skirt it. It's not dysfunction, it's corruption. And despite its gaudy price tag, the federal budget is not even close to the worst example of this corruption. That distinction belongs to the administrative state, the dismantling of which must a top priority for the next conservative president. The term administrative state refers to the policymaking work done by the bureaucracies of all the federal government's departments, agencies, and millions of employees. Under Article I of the Constitution, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. That is, federal law is enacted only by elected legislators in both houses of Congress. This exclusive authority was part of the Framers' doctrine of separated powers. 
They not only split the federal government's legislative, executive, and judicial powers into different branches. They also gave each branch checks over the others. Under our constitution, the legislative branch Congress is far and away the most powerful and, correspondingly, the most accountable to the people. In recent decades, members of the House and Senate discovered that if they give away that power to the Article II branch of government, they can also deny responsibility for its actions. So today in Washington, most policy is no longer set by Congress at all, but by the administrative state. Given the choice between being powerful but vulnerable or irrelevant but famous, most members of Congress have chosen the latter. Congress passes intentionally vague laws that delegate decision-making over a given issue to a federal agency. That agency's bureaucrats not just unelected but seemingly unfireable then leap at the chance to fill the vacuum created by Congress's preening cowardice. The federal government is growing larger and less constitutionally accountable even to the president every year. L.A. combination of elected and unelected bureaucrats at the Environmental Protection Agency quietly strangles domestic energy production through difficult-to-understand rulemaking processes. L. bureaucrats at the Department of Homeland Security, following the lead of a feckless administration, order border and immigration enforcement agencies to help migrants criminally enter our country with impunity. L. bureaucrats at the Department of Education inject racist, anti-American, ahistorical propaganda into America's classrooms. L. bureaucrats at the Department of Justice force school districts to undermine girls' sports and parents' rights to satisfy transgender extremists. L. woke bureaucrats at the Pentagon force troops to attend training seminars about white privilege, and L. bureaucrats at the State Department infuse U.S. foreign aid programs with woke extremism about intersectionality and abortion. Point three. Unaccountable federal spending is the secret lifeblood of the Great Awakening. Nearly every power center held by the left is funded or supported, one way or another, through the bureaucracy by Congress. Colleges and school districts are funded by tax dollars. The administrative state holds 100% of its power at the sufferance of Congress, and its insulation from presidential discipline is an unconstitutional fairy tale spun by the Washington establishment to protect its turf. Members of Congress shield themselves from constitutional accountability often when the White House allows them to get away with it. Cultural institutions like public libraries and public health agencies are only as independent from public accountability as elected officials and voters permit. Let's be clear. The most egregious regulations promulgated by the current administration come from one place, the Oval Office. The president cannot hide behind the agencies, as his many executive orders make clear, his is the responsibility for the regulations that threaten American communities, schools, and families. A conservative president must move swiftly to do away with these vast abuses of presidential power and remove the career and political bureaucrats who fuel it. Properly considered, Restoring fiscal limits and constitutional accountability to the federal government is a continuation of restoring national sovereignty to the American people. In foreign affairs, global strategy, federal budgeting, and policymaking, the same pattern emerges again and again. Ruling elites slash and tear at restrictions and accountability placed on them. They centralize power up and away from the American people, to supranational treaties and organizations, to left-wing experts, to sight unseen all-or-nothing legislating, to the unelected career bureaucrats of the administrative state. As monolithic as the left's institutional power appears to be, 